I know it's a long video, but I included the chapters this time so that they could skip around. Welcome to the Hacker Homestead, where we hunt, grow, and share technology. <clears throat> Today we learn what the community has uncovered around the Ingenric T31 SoC, explore the birth of the Teacup Tinkerboard open source project. Oh, and guess who else has taken an interest to the videos? We'd like to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay specializes in taking your PCB dreams and making them a reality with a broad array of services and quick turnaround time. They don't just do PCBs, they also do 3D printing and injection molding. Are you just getting started? PCBWay hosts a library of community and open source projects. You can order these directly from their site or download them and modify it in something like KiCad. Tinker out your own modifications and get it going quickly. Short on bench time or squeamish about soldering? Upload your design and bill of materials, then use PCBWay's turnkey service. Their engineers will review, produce, and assemble it all for you, making it easier than ever to make prototypes and professional electronics projects at an affordable price. I will be using PCBWay as we develop out the tinkerboard around the T31. But you see, due to the nature of an emergent open source project, our team is spread out in different countries and we need the prototypes shipped directly to multiple countries. Yep, they can do that too. It's the PCB way. Before we go much further, a quick disclaimer. We're not sponsored by Ingenric, Isosci, or Lumisil, which are technically all the same company. We are but a, a wee band of novelty-seeking hackers exploring interesting stuff. But hey, Ingenric, if you wanted to make it rain with processors, dev kit, documentation, or hey, even cash. I'm just saying, I and the community would not be sad at all. And I would give some of it away. Mm -hmm. At present, you basically have two choices for your projects. A microcontroller like the Arduino slash ESP32, or a single board computer like the Raspberry Pi slash, I don't know, Odroid, or something more exotic like the O64, OX64. Beyond those, you're looking at something that starts quickly to veer away from the already loose interpretation of the term open source, or just use a laptop, desktop, or heck, an old thin client. Microcontrollers such as the Arduino are really designed to run a single application written on a host device like your laptop. They are fantastic as single purpose devices, but albeit they rely on the host computer to program the internal flash, and except for a few, that run MicroPython, we really can't retrieve the source and modify it. And none of those, that I know of at least, uh, let you modify the source code in the field without special tools to code and debug them. They can be very power efficient, and that's very important for battery applications and other reasons. Um, you can even enter a sleep mode or turn off specific modules within the chip. Microcontrollers also have rather limited program memory and a steep learning curve if you want to add more RAM. Microcontroller, not mini computer, right? Enter the Raspberry Pi and its Broadcom line of processors. There's no doubt that these are super marvels of performance in CPU and memory for the price. However, power management is limited by the lack of supported documentation uh, for things like sleep mode. Yeah. Single board computers are just that, a whole computer in a compact package. Are you with me? If not, tell me in the comments, or I have an idea. Why don't you go look at the thousands of videos on the differences and specifics of each between microcontrollers and single board computers. Moving along. In the professional IoT space, the landscape is a bit more broad. While the packages I already mentioned are used in IoT in different forms, the rise in demand for smart homes, businesses, manufacturing, and government have given to the rise of Chinese manufacturing and expertise in this area. And well, something is different about the Chinese industrial culture that we're not as used to here in the West. Things like patents, copyrights, they're not paid attention to the same way. Instead, ruthless competition is encouraged. What's that sound like? 
Transparency and unregulated iterative development of ideas? Hmm. Oh, it's the flippin' open source movement. It's the epitome of what ESR wrote about in his book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Ingenic? Ingenic. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Perhaps somebody could help me out. So, enter Ingenric Semiconductor. Found in 2005 and licensed the MIPS instruction set in 2009, they were a new player in the market. Other licensees of the MIPS instruction set include Broadcom, Microchip, Qualcomm, MediaTek. You might recognize those names. And Generic has done what any good company operating in the competition is good market would do. They produced an unapologetically competitive product at a compelling price. They leverage open source technologies and at least attempt to adhere to things like the GPL. Are they an open source company? Mm, no, but they do try. For example, at least for a subset of their products, they host a GitHub page with resources like the Linux kernel support without having to wait for it to be included upstream, data sheets, a bootloader, and other utilities. Links in the description. Check out their Haley platform. It's completely open source software and hardware. In 2020, Ingenric acquired and merged with ISSI and Lumicil. If you look at how Lumicil is spelled, it's L-U-M-I-S-S-I-L, -S -S which has I-S-S-I -S -S -I in it. Manufacturers have a way of doing these kind of things, especially when they do M&A activities. Their products are winding up in all sorts of things like IP cameras, watches, tablets, and mostly a slew of commercial industrial equipment, taking an approach of offering ultra low power performance processors for the next generation of devices. They are positioned to be a disruptor in the market. So why have we not heard of them before? Assuming you're not in the industrial space, my guess is somewhere between the hobby market is considered small potatoes and being squeezed out by the big Western players, <coughs> Broadcom, so with that out of the way, what are we looking at for the four to $12 per unit in low volume for the T31 processor? Hi, for those who haven't seen the previous videos, I prepared a playlist, but wanted to give you a quick synopsis thus far. I discovered a processor in a USB webcam by pure chance at a return outlet for a dollar. After hooking up UART, I was able to get a console and see that it included U-Boot, Linux, and BusyBox. My system has 64 megabytes of RAM and an 8 meg NOR flash. Lastly, I proceeded to successfully cross-compile a Hello World in C and run it. Also, just for fun, I tried this donut thing too. I will now proceed to communicate the high level, no, medium level. T31 specifications to you. We have a 1.5 gigahertz MIPS CPU. Also on board is a 500 megahertz RISC-V core that runs a real-time operating system. In theory, this could be used for an even lower power standby mode, triggering a fast boot of the big daddy MIPS core via something like a proximity sensor or, you know, a, other external stimulus. The video processor on board supports HEVC encoding, which is H.265, and AVC, aka H.264, with a maximum frame rate of 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames per second, or uh, 2592 by 1900 at 25 frames per second. The image sensor processor has a max resolution of 2592 by 2048, or 5 megapixels. It also includes lots of standard stuff like noise, color correction, and crop, uh, mirror, and flip. The T31 includes a built-in smart LCD controller that supports display resolutions of up to 800 by 600 at 60 hertz with 24-bit color, it supports 6800 and 8080 interfaces, and internal DMA operations. There is a single video input. It supports DVP, BT1120, BT656 and BT601, or you can use MIPI, MIPI, CSI, which is two lanes up to 1.5 gigabits, with a max resolution of 2592 by 1900 at 25 frames per second. Don't underestimate this port. It doesn't just have to be for a camera. 
but you can plug a camera into it. Things like HDMI bridges exist for delicious capture goodness. On the audio side of the house, there's an integrated uh, I squared S interface with a 24 bit ADC and a 24 bit DAC for analog in and out retrospectively. Memory. Depending on the model of the chip, it's going to come with either 64 or 128 megabytes of DDR2 on chip RAM. That is a max of one gigabit of memory on board for those who think that this sounds like a lot and um, think I might have my units wrong. Aha, we also support external static memory, or SRAM. The interface supports an 8-bit bus of up to six banks to switch. Each bank can be configured separately. This is very interesting for those wanting to learn more about how RAM works or if you just want to expand the amount of operational memory that you have on. There's a single channel successive approximation analog to digital controller with a 10-bit resolution. Yep, that's right. It's got an ADC on chip in addition to the audio. Think like um, for raw touchscreen input. Support for an onboard Ethernet controller, GPIO ports, SPI, and three UARTs. Count them, two SDIO controllers. Yes, if you are willing to trade off the onboard LCD, Ethernet, and I2S, you can run two SD cards with no additional hardware. For example, SDIO GPS or Wi-Fi card, plus the obvious mass storage options. The boot ROM even has the second controller baked into the boot sequence. Speaking of booting, you can also boot from the USB 2.0 OTG interface. This supports up to 16 endpoints. Whew! I said it all. This SOC is a perfect balance. Linux support with the performance to run a console or drive a frame buffer display, low power modes, expandable memory, multiple boot options, HD video input, audio in and out, on board, USB, OTG, and ethernet, and other things. What it doesn't have on board is almost as important. It doesn't have a built-in flash to wear out or stuff malicious code into, nor Wi-Fi or Bluetooth baked in if you don't need or want it for upgradability, security, or power reasons. Now, when you get into the thick of it, there are trade-offs that happen due to there only being so many pins, but this little puppy gives a huge bang for its buck, and most of the compromises can be resolved with USB, SPI, I2C, or heck, even bit banging with GPIO. It's suited for portable, embedded, and learning projects, and I want it so bad. Okay, enough. We have to work for what we want, especially when we want it on our terms. So, what are we gonna do about it? Boop, 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 boop. We're at the Tinkerboard update. Tinkerboard update, tinker, tinker, tinkerboard update. At the end of my last video, I said I was going to make a tinkerboard using the T31. Turns out I'm not the only person, and with a few key people who I had never met before uh, showing interest, it was time to set up a Discord server and get to work. That was about two weeks ago, and currently there are about 12 people who have joined. One note is that this server is the Hacker Homestead official Discord server and not limited to discussions around the Tinkerboard or T31. It is, however, the current hot topic. Uh, come join the discussion on your favorite ideas, gadgets, projects, and more. Let's take a quick look at what AD Beta, Bogdan the Geek, Captain Ron, and myself have come up with and will be the official Rev A of the Tinkerboard. Similar to the camera that I found in the wild, this will run Linux and contain the tools to allow you to log in, tinker, and write your own programs. We do have a general roadmap that I'll share in future updates for those following along at home. What you're looking at is considered a development board or a minimal viable product. We decided to go with the higher T31, 128 megabytes of memory, a minimum of 8 megabytes of NOR flash memory via SPI in your choice of SIP or DIP packages, full-size SD card slot, MIPI CSI port that is compatible with the Raspberry Pi camera module, USB-C, 
DC Barrel Jack, UART for consoling, GPIO, SPI, audio, and many other pins out to headers. A big tip of the hat to Bogdan the Geek for his ability to so quickly take the group's feedback and turn it into a functional PCB design. So, initial software goals in addition to running Linux will include everything you need to program directly on the board. Not sure exactly what form that'll take, but at the time of this recording, we'll attempt to include a couple text editors, several programming tool chains to choose from, such as a simple MIPS assembler, C compiler, BASIC, Python, and Lua. Also planning on offering a console via USB and UART as well as USB networking and a means to console in via browser without any special hardware installed, and leverage something like UVC for frame buffer output. The desire is to be able to provide a programming environment even if you're plugging into something like a Chromebook or other lockdown platform. As the stack takes shape, there are plans to certify versions of things like the TIC80 Fantasy console and emulators. But first, we need to finish our initial orders and start to build and test the stack for this board using open source software. Yeah. I invite you to leave your creative ideas and comments and come join the conversation on our Discord server and check out our GitHub page as well. This project was made possible by your interest and engagement, and so keep it up. Closing comments, almost there. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today and all the interest around this project. I'll be continuing to post periodic updates on Teacup as we progress. Don't miss out on upcoming videos. I have a lot of different kinds of teardowns queued up. If you're interested in coming along with us, it really helps the channel when you subscribe and hit the bell icon. One more thing. I am planning some giveaways very soon, so keep an eye out for those. Until next time, happy hacking.